uh, strain profile perfectly on the detector. And here's the proof. Again, uh, you've seen this already. That's the measurement with a slit at several distances, at different distances. And uh, this is the measurement from a radial collimator at uh, 430 millimeters distance from the sample. And you see, if you extrapolate the measurement with the slits to zero, so to the sample point, you, you end up at the positions uh, that are recorded by the collimator. So in other words, the collimator, although it is at a, a large distance, so which leaves a lot of space for sample movement, which is important if you want to, to measure engineering samples, large samples, uh, uh, we need all this space. You can't position the slit closer than 100 millimeters if your sample is already 100 millimeters large. So um, to make it short, with the collimators, you image the strain uh, correctly uh, and with a slit only if you are very close to the sample. So let's say closer than 40 millimeters. So you see, I'm a fan of collimators. And uh, this is, for an example, the set we have on, on salsa. We use, uh, for the vertical beam definition, uh, two, four, or 10 millimeters beam height. And horizontally, we go down to 0 0.6 millimeters. And we have two and four millimeters with uh, primary and secondary for measurements in larger samples. Coming to lateral resolution, you can improve the lateral resolution. I said at the beginning, you shouldn't go too far, but uh, of course uh, uh, you can go quite far depending on the grain size of your material. And this is one way to improve the resolution at interfaces or surfaces. You, you penetrate your gauge volume, you enter your gauge volume, this, this gray box, successively into the sample. So imagine this is the 0 0.6 millimeters um, and you enter just a bit. So you improve your lateral resolution. Uh, you see as well the, in the intensity distribution here that I've plotted, which is, the, uh, which is called the sampled gauge volume. So the part of the gauge volume, which is actually in the sample and is diffracting, uh, that there's most intensity at the surface, which improves again, your resolution. In other words, this technique uh, allows you to measure close to a surface or an interface. Uh, the maximum we were, could reach was 40 micrometers. So this, this point here at 40 micrometers from the interface, and this, this works then perfect in combination with uh, X-ray diffraction where you are very sensitive to, the, to really the surface. And uh, combining these two methods, you get a complete stress profile of your of your sample. Here uh, again, shortly, uh, the, this is the, the full width of maximum of the sampled gauge volume when you enter the gauge volume into the sample. So also the gauge volume is larger, the, um, um, the, the sampled gauge volume is compared to the full gauge volume much smaller, which uh, provides this uh, resolution. And then for the calculations, we say that the center of gravity of this intensity dis, uh, distribution in the sampled gauge volume is actually the measuring point. And here, that means uh, this is now your scan, you're entering your large gauge volume and you measure at distances. Look, you, you enter your gauge volume one millimeter, but your center of gravity is at 0 0.25 millimeters. So you are very sensitive to uh, the near surface stresses. Uh, as an example, this is uh, the interface of, um, of a coating on, on a substrate. You get the intensity distribution of the coating here. The two theta, or then according to the strain variation here, and this uh, you get from the substrate. And the result looks like this after analysis. 
we get uh, uh, the strain profile and, and later after three orthogonal measurements, the stress profile. In this, uh, the, the whole of the sub, uh, substrate close to the interface here, the one millimeter region is important. And uh, we can even resolve, could even resolve the stress within this one millimeter thick coating. Um, this plot here shows the errors that you get during such measurements using slits, using collimators. I don't go into details, just say, telling it is possible and uh, it's a kind of a standard measurement today. How to further improve an instrument? We have now the highest flux that we can get. Uh, we have uh, uh, position sensitive detectors, we have good beam optics. So now we want to measure fast and um, if we can even doing some imaging, that would be perfect for um, in situ experiments. So this is one, uh, one example where we were uh, in situ printing um, additive, uh, printing a nickel piece on additive, uh, the additive manufacturing technique. And what we could do by, we could image the vertical line of this build while it was, was building and obtain the diffraction peaks from diff after different times at different heights in the sample. And this is possible due to an event mode data acquisition. So this is then the next step after the, uh, the neutron equipment, you need the, the right acquisition cards to, uh, to be ready for several kinds of experiments. This uh, event mode is, um, works like this. You are, it is not that you acquire for some time a diffraction peak and, and then store it. Now here you, every time a neutron event takes place or a neutron enters the detector, it's, it's time, it gets a timestamp, it gets a coordinate, and this is stored on the memory. And at the same time, in addition, you have AD converters, analog digital converters, and uh, digital inputs that you can store at the same time. So you can record um, uh, temperatures at the same time. You can give uh, trigger signals to cameras. You can uh, record uh, positions of uh, an additional motor of a rotation table, what, whatever. So you can you, uh, you save all information at the same time synchronously. And at the end, you do binning as, as shown here. So you can choose how, how many uh, time frames you're selecting, how large the time frames are over which you're binning. And you do this for your neutrons and at the same time for the other signals that you were recording. And this is how you can do such, uh, perform such in situ experiments. Here on the right hand side, even uh, this is uh, uh, using the tensile stress rig doing fatigue loading, you can do uh, stroboscopic measurements. And actually the advantage of this event mode is you just record everything and during data analysis, you decide how you want to bin your data. And um, so you can do everything. This is the big advantage. And this is as well the disadvantage because you can spend weeks optimizing and optimizing. So. That's the price you have to pay. Important <clears throat> as well is sample alignment. Um, and i um, uh, show you an example. This is uh, a measurement on a, on a friction steer weld. It's very beautiful and you get the typical profile of a friction steer weld. Here the retrieving side, the advancing side. Uh, we have the three stress components. So this is the longitudinal and going in, in tensile direction and more compressive, the transversal ones. Um, since stress is determined from three measurements at least, or six if you determine the full stress tensor, 
you must make sure that your measurements that you perform are always at the same position. So positioning is very important, or as those who know him still, Peter Webster said, uh, the three most important things in strain scanning are positioning, positioning, positioning. So, and uh, show you one effect. Um, I used this data set and then misaligned the longitudinal measurement. And you see how this changes the stress determination here, especially at these, these points in the weld seam. So positioning is important and how to do that. Um, different solutions are, are present at uh, the different instruments. And uh, one is you use uh, a measuring arm like, like this with a, a caliper or with a laser scanner, uh, which allows you to determine the coordinates on, on samples, even such a um, complex shaped sample, and then link it with the coordinate system of your instrument. This is one possibility this, which is applied. Um, as well, you have to find theodolites on instruments or a camera system as we are using it, uh, which shows uh, three centimeters roughly of the, of the sample. And um, works like this. So we have different cameras here. The green circles show the cameras. And these are the pictures of the cameras. And if you glue now a, a reference mark on your sample, for instance, a ball, you can even automatically by uh, pattern matching find the center of this ball. And so you know uh, when this reference point is on the reference point of your instrument. Or we use it for alignment, finding the center of a rotation by automatically fitting, so to, to, to pattern matching, fitting the center of a, of a ball that we use for alignment while rotating it. And uh, so this is used for instrument and for sample alignment. A step we want to do that had been, the, the, the development has had started already and uh, we intend to implement this uh, is to, to read automatically um, or to transform the coordinates we get from the cameras into world coordinates or into the coordinates of the, the instrument. I want, don't want to go too much into this, but this, this, this shows here is the camera plane. Uh, this is a focal point. Here is the sample and uh, there are ways, I mean, uh, like laser scanners determine uh, positions uh, scan samples, we, we want to do this on the instrument as well. And uh, because this would then allow to give the command directly to the instrument control saying now we have uh, the distance uh, between the reference point and the sample is, is such and such. So uh, tell the uh, instrument automatically to go to this position. And um, we want to do this as well automatically using a laser that we then switch on. And uh, by some filtering, we extract this, this laser dot, fit its position, and then convert it into the coordinates uh, of the instrument in order to automatically position the sample. Other ways of sample alignment, uh, even more precise, if you uh, think of uh, surface measurements, interface measurements, um, you must know precisely where the gauge volume is with respect to your sample. Precisely means to better than uh, 20 micrometers. And this is possible by doing such entry scans, as I said before, you can not only use them to determine the strain profile, nor you use them at the same time uh, to find exactly the surface of your sample. And you do some entry curves. That means you plot the intensity while your gauge volume is entering the sample. And uh, then you get such 
intensity profiles that you fit with the uh, with the model which is available on uh, different instruments and this determines the surface position to within even uh, 10 micrometers and uh, the software takes into account different sample geometries because the sample geometry influences of course the intensity curve by the gauge volume is penetrating the sample and yeah the the lens webinar is about um, future trends new trends in instrumentation and um, one trend is on standardization definitely and uh, why is this necessary so we have now optimized our instruments why do we want to standardize different tasks and it is not only to to increase the confidence of industry in our technique because of course uh, for industry our technique is very interesting or should be very interesting and it is as well this point identify and mitigate sources of errors in measurements and to quantify them and report them to to have a better uh, estimation of of uncertainties in in the measurements um, you've seen uh, in the simulation i've done with this uh, for this friction steer weld measurement um, introducing an error in the position of, of one measurement introduces an error in stress and to quantify the influence of such systematic errors of the experimental setup that's an important step and we're actually uh, since long time working on uh, uh, different ways of standardization it started already at the end of the 90s with the vanas uh, project uh, this is the most famous sample the ring and plug uh, this work is, is ongoing. It, it led to uh, an ISO standard, thanks to the uh, European CEN-TC 138 working group, uh, which was still working the past years, and we have the standard now. And now we are going a step further <clears throat> with new projects and this is a collaboration at the moment between ISIS and the Instrument Engine X, uh, the Maya Leibniz Centrum in, in Munich, Safari Reactor in South Africa, and, and us at the ILL uh, within the Brightness Project to standardize the instrument alignment and uh, especially the way to determine the the uncertainties, the systematic errors of the specific experimental setup, and then report it to the final data and, um, and estimate the, the real uncertainty on the stress data at the end. Uh, this is our goal, this is ongoing, and a new project that will, will come up is Easy Stress, which will harmonize the link between industrial software for stress analysis so like finite element uh, modeling and measurements coming from neutron sources and this, with this i want to close my talk i thank you for your attention and i am ready for questions thank you very much Stilo. <clears throat> so now i ask if there are questions I'm not quite sure how to handle that, but uh, <clears throat> there is one question uh, uh, by uh, Rifai Mosley. <laughs> he wants to know what is the resolution of the coordinate measurements using the camera system? I can only tell you for, for the cameras we've got. One pixel is 22 micrometers in reality, but of course you can... Um, um, depending on your camera, achieve any resolution you want. Um, 
This is the compromise to have the camera at a distance of 50 centimeters to leave space for the samples using magnifying lenses. And so we have 20 micrometers. Actually, for um, measurements, we, we say the uh, positioning precision should, be, should not exceed 10% of the gauge volume. So this means if you work with a 0 0.6 millimeter gauge volume, you should uh, align your samples as accurate at 16 micrometers which we can achieve with this system. Okay. And additionally, these are three cameras. So we have uh, uh, some components. Another question by Eftimius uh, Polatidis from PSI concerns the in situ additive manufacturing uh, measurements. And the other question is how can you disentangle the, the shifts caused by temperature fluctuations and residual strains and how good can you uh, know the temperature in your gauge volume? Yeah, here I must say you should wait for the publication. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but we had many sensors around this experiment uh, synchronized with the, uh, the neutron measurement. So, um, and uh, we are publishing this. Uh, so you attempt to measure the, the temperature uh, so that you have an estimate of the temperature influence. Of course, you must take into account the measurement. You must have a good temperature measurement uh, to subtract uh, this uh, uh, temperature influence from, from strain, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, not from strain, from the, mm -hmm. from the yeah. measured strain to, in order to get the real strain. Yes, okay. Then there is a further question, uh, and that is if there are further col collaborations with other sources than the ones that you named, like uh, JPARC or SNS, I mean, uh, I would say the, the instrument responsibles know each other and uh, there's all, all the time an exchange uh, for specific pro, uh, programs like uh, brightness. Of course, uh, there are then some partners, but um, especially for brightness, we invite all other sources to, uh, to join us. Mm -hmm. Uh, because this standard or this, the, the procedures we are, we are developing, um, at the end, they make only sense if uh, everybody applies them. And uh, as well as standard, I must say this, is not something fixed forever. A standard has to be um, further developed. It has to adapt to, to new uh, developments, so the the collaboration between all sources is actually important and wanted. Good. Then there is another question from Werner Schweiker, who calls himself a, a non-expert, but he wants to naively ask uh, uh, if the using time of flight uh, with a white beam, uh, if that one shouldn't work also with a slit. Um, on the primary side, yes, for the for defining the gauge volume. Um, of course, the precision of the of the, the width of the gauge volume is then dependent depending on the on the neutron guide, so the divergence in the guide and the slit distance. Uh, this is one one point, but uh, there's not a huge influence on on the strain values. On the secondary side, um, since you have the, the pulsed structure of the, of, the, um, of the incoming beam, of the white beam, and so less flux on average than, than you can have on a monochromatic instrument. And in order to, to improve the, um, the efficiency of the instrument, you want on the secondary side a detector which is as large as possible. And uh, but you need as well define a gauge volume because your sample is larger than the beam. And so the way to do this is the use of radial collimators. And that's what uh, the time of flight instruments are using for the secondary definition of the diffracted beam dimension. Okay, uh, so a question maybe from my side, uh, you're using the, the collaboration with uh, different uh, sources, uh, do you also collaborate already with the ESS, which are also planning and, and 
an engineering diffractometer, the beer instrument, and do you what are your expectations to this instrument in, in case you have spent thoughts on this uh, development? The expectation, expectations on beer. So, so beer is a very clever setup. It's too clever that I would understand it. It's a, it's a multi um, chopping, how to say, um, oh, um, uh, time of flight instrument. Um, it will, I mean, at the moment we are, we're collaborating with ESS because uh, in, in the, the brightness project is uh, including ESS. Um, and concerning the instruments, they complement each other. You can't, or my opinion is you can't say uh, the best instrument is, is a time of flight instrument or the best instrument is a monochromatic one. Um, you will find uh, always uh, pros and cons for the different uh, neutron source in terms of flux, in terms of uh, strain resolution, uh, and then on the instruments in terms of lateral resolution, what you can achieve and uh, where the advantages. Once you get one peak only on another instrument, you get the diffractogram. If you have more a material science problem, then getting the full diffractogram is uh, maybe an advantage. So uh, I don't think there is this super instrument. Uh, they are all good and, uh, and complementary. Good, I have a further question and that is for the standardization, uh, would it make sense to involve also the International Atomic Energy Agency? Mm -hmm. Good, a good point. Yes, to think about. Uh, yes, because they have partially been active in such uh, such. Mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, as I said, this, these things, uh, the, these um, uh, developments and and ideas to to harmonize uh, uh, um, the output of of uh, experiments is uh, uh, only works if everybody participates. And um, and it it improves the results and the reliability of results uh, for everybody, for academic users, in the same way as for for industrial users. Mm -hmm. Good. And then I have a question here that reads: uh, Normal Q focusing uh, only works for one Q. How can you solve the flat resolution as a function of Q by a curved monochromate? Um, there, are, yeah, there are aspects I didn't talk about. Um, the measurement example was actually a mosaic monochromator used. And um, when you use a, a curved monochromator, what you do is, uh, this is to improve the, uh, the strain resolution, you do focusing in the, uh, by generating a wavelength gradient. And this is, um, and, if you would, if you have a focused monochromator, maybe the question goes in this direction. If you're focusing monochromator, a bent crystal monochromator, and you use a slit optics for defining your, your primary beam, then the slit will uh, hide different parts of the monochromator asymmetrically. So you get a huge wavelength gradient in your gauge volume at the end. It shifts your, your peak hugely when you uh, when you scan across, when you scan the sample across. Um, by using a radial collimator, you image the whole divergence range of the monochromator onto your sample position, onto your sample. And this way you get uh, um, a, a homogeneous wavelength. However, uh, 
or you image the gradient, the wavelength gradient you need, you want onto the sample position. However, it remains a wavelength gradient that you see when you scan an, uh, a surface or an interface across uh, this gauge volume. And, but then there are methods to correct for this, for the peak shift you obtain, you get by this wavelength gradient. But the gradient is necessary to, on the secondary side, refocalize your beam because you have a huge divergence. A huge incoming divergence would broaden your beam but by generating a gradient in such a way that uh, you have uh, a lower wavelength at the side where your beam is uh, diffracted to, um, to higher angles and, and longer wavelength where it's diffracted to lower angles uh, is uh, compressing the beam and you get good strain resolution. Okay, thank you. Let me maybe ask you a last question. We have talked about the different roles of monochromatic and, and time of flight instruments. Do you see a role also for transmission strain mapping? Oh yeah, um, uh, talking about brackage imaging. Yes. Is, uh, I suppose this is, of course, these are uh, uh, great techniques and um, uh, Limitation like this is, uh, it is um, uh, the lateral resolution is given only in, uh, in one plane and in the thickness you have no lateral resolution. So you see the, the average over the thickness of the sample. Uh, but, but this is correct. You, you see there's no instrument that is um, perfect for all types of samples. Uh, but this is a great method. Uh, you get uh, an image of the, the strain distribution in a, in a thin sample, uh, uh, relatively fast and easy, and um, which you can use uh, then even to plan an experiment where you want to, with spatial resolution, uh, determine the stress uh, in, in the complete sample. So this could help you to uh, detect the interesting points. And new developments in this direction are now uh, breakage tomography, and um, uh, this uh, might solve uh, that problem of, of uh, lateral resolution. So there are uh, great developments going on. Okay, thank you. I think now I uh, hear the church bells already ringing. I don't know if you hear it, but uh, we have to come to an end. So I want to thank you very much. And uh, I also thank all the participants uh, and with that, I say goodbye until the next Lens webinar. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. So. There's one question missing. Can we contact these people uh, later on? Uh, I don't know how that works. There was an additional question in the end about the focusing monochromator yeah. and the gauge volume. No, there is no registration, so I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I do know the name. But the people can, of course, uh, email you. I mean, uh, yes. yes, they can email. Like this. That, that's, that's Please keep the name if you find it. Yashislav M. Is that? Is I that don't, him? I don't know. Yeah, that's him. Um, if he's still there, I could uh, Is answer. Not, um, let me check. He's yeah. Oh, he's still in. He's still in. Okay. Yes. So I answer directly. Uh, yes. The point but here up. is um, <laughs> the vertical focusing uh, of the monochromator. Um, I mean, what you get from a monochromator is a very diverge beam, it's a large beam. So you, what you have to do is you have to select actually the beam, the, the beams that um, uh, contain the wavelength you want. This is the point. And, uh, and here again, if you use uh, uh, radial collimators, you do exactly this. And it is, um, you only define a gauge volume uh, when you have a, a collimator and uh, which selects the beams coming from the monochromator. So I, I hope I asked, I answered this question.
So then, Markus, uh, we can stop. There are no questions open. Yes, uh, I, I, I cannot uh, stop this meeting. I think that is um, Francois and uh, Valerie. Okay, then uh, I leave. As I said, goodbye already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I say goodbye to you personally. Okay. Bye.